Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Eckert. Welcome to Houston Cougar Football Central. We've got head coach Tony Levine's weekly press conference coming up. But first, let's take a look at Saturday's game against the University of Alabama Birmingham. Now, this is only the second time an Astros team has even faced the Mariners ace, Felix Hernandez. The first time was a win right here back in 2007. And I want to close out with this. The last time these two teams met, and actually the only time they met, was back in 2006 for the Insight Bowl. I'm Sarah Eckert at Toyota Center, where Dwight Howard and the Rockets opened training camp on Saturday. Coming up, we'll tell you what the big man thought of his very first official practice with his new team. The Cougars will open their brand new stadium on Friday night when they play right here on John O'Quinn Field. But it's sophomore quarterback John O'Corn who will be leading this team. As soon as Howard and company left the stage, the streets around Toyota Center cleared out very quickly as fans waited for over two hours to get a glimpse of the newest Rockets big man. But of course they say it was well worth it. We'll definitely expect a lot more offense this time around between these two teams. This game features the nation's top two quarterbacks in passing efficiency. Well, thank you very much, Marius. I'm joined by infielder Nate Fryman here. And Nate, as a Rule 5 player, how much more pressure and scrutiny do you feel to perform? For this group, it's more about family. Their teen mom, Shannon, was diagnosed with a rare form of liver cancer 18 months ago. And her latest surgery was last Tuesday, causing her to miss watching her team and her son play for a state title. Even though Matt Brown wasn't here at the press conference, Strong was able to speak with him last night. He told him he's always respected him and he's just trying to build on what Mac built here and to always feel welcome to the program. Brown told him, don't try to be like me. You are who you are because of what you've done, so continue to be who you are. In Austin, Sarah Eckert, CSN. Now Howard closed out the morning session shooting free throws. He tries to come up with some goals before each season and this year he has three main ones. It's to shoot 75 to 80% from the line, earn Defensive Player of the Year, and help Houston win a championship. And we're closing out the month of July, Steve, and Chris Carter, obviously very, very hot this month, making a case to be Player of the Month. What have you seen from him? What kind of adjustments has he made to give himself such success this month? In his first season in Waco, running back Lake Seastrunk emerged as a star last November. And also impressive, the Dynamo now have a 33-game home unbeaten streak in all competitions. That's the second longest streak in league history, trailing Real Salt Lake. Now they'll go for the tie next weekend when they host San Jose. Heading into the bye week, Watt has 10 passes batted down. The NFL record for a season by defensive lineman is 13, held by Reggie White back in 1991. The Rose family has already already built quite a legacy at U of H. LJ's father, Lyndon, played right on the same court for the five Slamma Jamma teams in the early 1980s. His late uncle, Cecil, scored more than 1,200 points for the Cougars in the mid-70s, and they both played under Hall of Fame coach Guy V. Lewis. And now LJ is proud to carry on the family tradition. Hello and welcome to the Sportsnet Central Update. I'm Sarah Eckert. The Astros finished a three-game set in Oakland, but first, Bill O'Brien gets his first win as an NFL coach. Well, Tuesday was payday for J.J. Watt, the two-time Pro Bowler signed the richest contract ever for a defensive player in the NFL. How excited are you as a manager to see one of your top prospects up with the big league club? Well, let's start out with Jose Altuve. He's on a 10-game hitting streak. What's working for him? This is where it all began for Homer Bailey, starting with T-ball right on this field in LaGrange, Texas. And what a legacy he's left for this town of nearly 5,000 people, one that's celebrating his second no-hitter in as many years. And Homer Bailey becomes only the The first one I cried, I mean, cried like a baby. And this one, I kind of kept everything in check. The first thing I thought of was when he was raising those arms up. I've seen that two other times because when he was a freshman and a senior when we won state, he was on the mound for the last out, last pitch. And uh, then, you know, same expression last year. And just seeing the joy on his face. It's what everybody's talking about. And not just this event, but, but every time Homer starts, you know, people are glued to their TVs. No hitters is just kind of icing on the cake. David and his wife Karen watched nervously from the couch in their isolated country home. And the way he was throwing the ball and commanding this fastball, I really thought he had a chance. But uh, so after the sixth inning with nine outs left. One, two. Perfect through six. No, you definitely sit in the same place. You cross your legs the same. When you go through the kitchen or go to the bathroom, you go the same exact route. I mean, no, uh, everything is. Yeah, you don't change nothing. <laughs> as dominant as Homer was on this night, his parents didn't see this kind of big league potential in their small town boy. As a young player, uh, very young, he was 
you know, he was good, but just, you know, not, I had other ones just as good as him, okay? And then I don't know, he hit high school and then something happened. You know, the ball started coming out of his hand, like really, really good. No hits, Bruce Shelby. He was throwing about 89 at that point as a freshman, so you could see it. And you knew something special was coming along. And then he kept, he'd work out and uh, worked on his mechanics, worked on his balance, and uh, worked on hitting spots. And uh, it's not just something, he was born with natural talent, but he also worked at it. Or is this fly to right and struck out? Line drive, center field, inning over. Over Bailey will go to the mound in the ninth inning. And that hard work paid off. After leading the LaGrange Leopards to two state titles, Homer was drafted seventh overall in 2004. He made his major league debut three years later. But it took much longer than that to live up to the high expectations placed on high draft picks. Oh, no doubt. When he, you know, first got called up the first couple of years, he, oh, he struggled, struggled big time. I actually feel like that's what's made him what he is today. Bailey. Tomato, one out. <laughs> he told me one time, Dusty Baker told him, he said, Homer, you're going to be a very, very good major league pitcher one day. Two and two on a brave you. Two out. Anybody that's been kicked down and came back up as many times as you have, you know, that just shows you have it. A strike away and out away is Homer Bailey. Ground ball to third, Frazier gloves, throw to first, and Homer Bailey, for the second time in his major league career, has tossed a no-hitter. David did speak to his son that night, but only briefly. However, the two were able to talk for over an hour the next morning. You know, just the mushy stuff that a daddy and a son would do, you know, just real quick. We won't get into that, you know. I don't want to get start getting emotional here, okay? Oh, what a celebration on the field. I don't know what's going on to, to make this happen, but it's pretty special. The Bailey family, they produced an awfully darn good one. To do it once is extremely special. To do it twice is, um, you know, kind of, I really don't have the words right now. In LaGrange, Sarah Eckert, CSN. <laughs> After playing in just five games on varsity his sophomore year in the small Pennsylvania town of Huntington, talented quarterback John O'Corn and his family moved to Fort Lauderdale. You know, my mom wanted to be uh, near family if we were going to make a move, so, um, you know, we decided uh, as, as a family, as a whole, that, that both academically and athletically, uh, if I was going to, you know, seriously make a push to, to play college football and pursue this dream, that we would have to move to Florida. In his junior year at St. Thomas Aquinas High School in Fort Lauderdale, O'Corn played in only a handful of games before coming the full-time starter his senior year. That's when he led his team to the state championship, set school records, and was named the Florida 7A Player of the Year. But Cougars head coach Tony Levine saw O'Corn's potential and offered him a scholarship even before his first ever full year as a starter. I, it really meant a lot to me, and it was something that, you know, to this day, I, I want to make his word look good because he took such a big chance on me. Um, and, you know, he told me from the get-go, he said, I've never done this before. I've never offered somebody before a uh, quarterback that I, that I hadn't seen throw in person, I hadn't met in person. So we ended up uh, evaluating 27 quarterbacks nationally, and uh, he ended up being uh, ranked first by our staff. We did a lot of research on these young men, certainly, and, and uh, looked at his spring practice film, talked to a number of people that had him at their camps, and just felt really, really good about everything we, we had found out about John. O'Corn was quickly thrown into the fire at U of H, becoming the starter just three games into the 2013 season after the incumbent David Pylan was forced to end his career due to multiple concussions. O'Corn ended the season leading all true freshmen in the nation with his 28 touchdowns. His 3,117 yards were only 14 shy of the Houston rookie passing record set by Kevin Cobb in 2003. And he was named the American Athletic Conference Freshman of the Year. But O'Corn knew he still had a lot of work to do during the offseason. 
Number one was leadership and um, really just, just learning our offense and getting that down has allowed me to, to focus more on learning defenses. I told him you need to, you don't need to be a quarterback, you need to be a manager. But I think what we're going to see this year is us having the ability to go much, much faster offensively because of the experience John gained and how much com more comfortable he is in, in this year's offense. O'Corn told me he feels very confident running the more up-tempo offense. It's allowed him to expand his knowledge of the game and really just play at a different level. He also said he's in the best shape of his life after adding about 27 pounds this offseason. Levine said it's increased his arm strength and should certainly help with his durability. With the Cougars, Sarah Eckert, CSN.